forward on this. All right, uh, good morning, Senator Munson. It's uh, wonderful to see you today. And I'm so glad that we have this opportunity to speak with one another in this way and that we can record this for uh, not only our annual general meeting of Autism Ontario, but um, for, our, for many Canadians to see an opportunity to share what we have today, which is to thank you for your work as a, as a Canadian Senator for so many years. And now that you're retiring from that position, but not retiring from your work in this area, we are thrilled to um, have a conversation together today, just to briefly about um, the work that you've done over so many years, uh, particularly since the pay now or pay later document. Um, but so much has happened during that time. And so we'd love to um, speak a little bit about that. But secondly, we're also, Autism Ontario is honored today to also be acknowledging that you've been chosen as this year's recipient um, in the professional category of our highest honor, which is the Jerry Bloomfield Award. Um, so we're thrilled to be presenting that, um, but we really wanna talk a little bit about your work and, and spend the, our time, the limited time that we have on that today. Um, so thank you so much for this, Jim. Mark, Mark, thank you, and it's wonderful to be part of your AGM, and uh, I'm glad you used the word retiring because I'm not retired. I just graduated into it. I'm only 75, so there's still lots of work to do and, and many roads to travel, so wonderful to be part of your, your meeting today. Awesome. Thank you. So let's, let's start from the beginning. Um, you know, in thinking about our conversation today, I think it's good to ask the question of why was the pay now or pay later report important at the time it was created? Um, and how or why did you become involved in its creation and the champion of that report for so many years? Um, I literally, you know, walked onto the hill one day in around 2003, 2004, uh, shortly after being appointed to the Senate. And there in front of the uh, centennial claim was a gentleman, a civil servant by the name of Andrew Kavchak. And Andrew had a board in front of him saying, help me help my son. He has, he is autistic, he has autism. And uh, he looked at me and he, other people were walking by him and he said, uh, Senator Munson, I knew you were at CTV one time and you're a reporter and you know a good story and you can't walk by me, please listen to my story. So I listened to his story. And we walked to our off, my office and I, I was moved by it, moved to tears, uh, because normally you see people on the hill in big groups, but you rarely see a civil servant at noon hour on his lunch hour uh, protesting for more services for his son. And he was crying out for help. Thus began my way of, I, I guess I can say I stumbled up to the hill uh, into this um, new phase of my life. I did want to do something about children's rights and disability rights, but I had not focused on autism until I talked to Andrew. But I decided I'd give a statement in the Senate. So I gave a statement. Then I asked uh, senators, um, well, that's made me feel good, but nobody's seen or heard of it. It's in the walls of the Senate. Well, they said, you should launch an inquiry. I said, how do I do that? Make a longer statement. So I made a longer statement, uh, which made it into inquiry to engage senators to bring them into the room on the issue. And I was beginning my learning curve and understanding the whole thing. So I pressured and bullied as much as I could my fellow senators into having a committee report at our social affairs committee. And thus uh, with uh, the chair and co-chair Art Eggleton and Senator Keon, they said, okay, Jimmy, we'll do this for you. We'll do this for you. It seemed these senators were very kind about it and I was appreciative of that, but, but I had no idea where it was going. And then, uh, we listened to um, experts, advocates, families, and parents. And a little inside story on the word pay now or pay later, autism, families, and crisis. That actual title came from one of the persons who uh, testified. And he was a gentleman from Fredericton, New Brunswick. And he looked at the committee and said, well, folks, I've told you my story. And as a society or country, you're going to have to pay now or pay later. Well, I know a headline when I see it after 35 years of journalism, and thus the report was written, but it wasn't an extensive report, but boy, did it spark a wave across the country in the autism community. 
and there, there was that report. And uh, that was the first part of this incredible journey in the field of autism. I remember being part of some of the conversations that occurred at that time. Um, and there were gatherings around the country with researchers, with uh, parent advocates, um, autistic people, all talking about what, what does this mean and what do we need to be doing on a national level? So what would you say since that time um, have been the important things that either have or haven't changed since the release of that report and on a national scale? Well, what we don't have yet is a national autism strategy, but we are getting there. And uh, it's like a puzzle, right? Little pieces of this puzzle are being put together in the hands of the government today. And this is before this last election is uh, a report that went to you know, the public health agency and they created it through the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences, which is an independent group. And that was in October, 2020. And that's a year ago. And they were given $1.5 million to come up over 16 months, working in collaboration with CASDA, Autism Ontario, and others across the country to work on this national autism strategy. Well, guess what? Or six months to go if this is going to be a 16 month uh, uh, process and we cannot afford to dilly dally any longer and uh, I may have retired but I'm not going away I still live in Ottawa and I will still be pushing this but on the on the collaborative side uh, we have seen a lot of things change governments and provincial governments have paid attention schools have paid attention communities, advocacy has grown stronger. And the biggest part of this is to see the media taking a hold of this story and running it. I mean, for example, in Ontario, the Toronto Star, people became more aware of what autism is, is, is and they weren't aware of it before. So to me, that's a victory and an achievement. And then creating um, CASDA, the coalition, I think that has been a very important thing. Watching the work of your group has been extremely important because you're at the center of this nation and what happens in Ontario spreads its wings across the country. So those are the, the kinds of good things that have happened. Um, and, uh, but there's so much more to do. Uh, but I, I, I always, I'm a person with the glasses always half full. You have to be. Uh, sometimes you're tired at the end of the day. Uh, but uh, in, my, in my new work, for example, I'm going to be doing some teaching and mentoring at the University of Victoria. And I plan to take the autism story into the workplace, into that academic world, even though I'll be talking about other things, and reminding the business school in the University of Victoria that one in five Canadians has a disability, intellectual, physical, or otherwise. And what is your business plan for hiring somebody with autism? I mean, it's there. Uh, you know, are you in business to get rich or are you there to enrich other people's lives? This is a really, I think, a, a continuing process. Um, so this battle will never be over uh, oh. and we need this national autism strategy. But we have we, we've, we've gone to a lot of good places, I think. I do, I do too. And I, we can almost taste it. So hopefully the next six months will be exactly as you said and we'll get there. Um, and, and continue on. And I'm delighted to know that you're going to continue to be advocating um, with all the history and knowledge and experience you've had. So it's, but I, I, I'm thinking now about the, these past years since the report. Um, if you can think about um, as you're in your advocacy work on behalf of autistic people and their families, are there some moments that have stayed with you um, that you recall that will stay with you for many years to come? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that question because there are two moments. Uh, one is, of course, uh, having the World Autism Awareness Day bill become law, April 2nd of each year, and for, for governments to recognize it, royal assent became law. It was a long, hard road to go, believe it or not, a simple bill like that. But to bring people together again, and as a result of that, in the Senate of Canada today, there are five senators at least who have a connection with the autism world. So leaving behind people who will continue to carry the swords um, to battle our way uh, into the hearts and minds of other politicians across the country. Uh, with that World Autism Awareness Day bill, that is that, that to me, uh, working with my wife, um, 
was an affair of the heart. So that's very important. But on an even more personal level, you in, in the news business, you, you can't tell a story if you're not there where the story is happening. And I've always would argue with news editors that I can't do that story from Ottawa. I have to go there. Well, the same thing as the politician. So I've traveled across Ontario and across the country. And one particular story will stay with me forever. It motivates me to this day. And I've stayed in touch. And that was in southwestern Ontario when my wife and I were traveling and listening to people. And um, a friend of mine uh, set us up with a meeting on a cold winter, windy day near Wingham, Ontario. And in a church basement, I walked in expecting four or five people. There had to be 50 to 60. Now, I'm a senator just trying to say, look, I'm on side. I'm, I'm an individual. I'm not part of any particular group, but here's what I'm doing. And here's how I'm trying to open doors, you know, tell me the story. It was, it was a tearful night, very, a lot of tears and a lot of anger uh, from parents. And these are farming groups and so on and so forth. And one woman stood before a microphone and I can still see her now. Uh, she said, uh, she has a teenage son who, who is autistic and, um, can have you know, violent tendencies from time to time, but he loves her. So at a as a teenager, her only escape would for her would be running down a country road with nobody around, trying to call the police to pick up her own son because he had uh, a, a violent tendencies that day. The next day, guess what they would be doing? They would be hugging. But what was she going to be doing that night? And that state, that picture, that image of a woman running down a country road motivated me to run down more roads to really keep the pressure up on the provincial government, connecting her with some groups in London, Ontario and others. And just, but that image and that picture is a motivating picture. To me, it's a, it, there's a, it's a tragic picture, but there's motivation. And there's, if you're there, I'm there to help. And I remember one, one gentleman saying that night, gee, Senator, we don't want to take it out all on you. We don't know where to go because nobody has walked through this door. Well, I walked through this door and I'm walking through other doors. So that, that is with me. That will stay with me. Thank you for that story. Um, yeah. What you described is an authenticity um, about advocacy and about making those connections with real people in real situations. And so right. that- and it, and it was so much so in other situations, very briefly, where they were in Halifax or out west, uh, just being in a person's home, just being there to listen, right? I mean, we all have time. You know, there's time and space for everybody. I've always said that. And people say they don't have time. Well, we always have time for somebody. Yeah. Absolutely. And so that- leads us to um, my final question really, and, and it comes nicely out of the stories you've just told, is in speaking to people who are advocating all across Canada and here in Ontario, parents, autistic people, staff, volunteers, what words of advice or encouragement would you give as they continue to make autism matter in Canada? Well, I actually wrote these ones down in anticipation of uh, a question like this. Work together share experiences, best practices, talk and pressure your politicians, keep them in the loop and follow, a, follow the developing files on, on, on disabilities and what progress can be made. I think, you know, in Autism Ontario, I think you know the picture, you know the picture really well. And I, the and I, reason I'm saying that is that when I walked into the, for the first time into your offices on King Street West, well, uh, I could feel the energy coming through the door before I even walked into your office. And I remember my wife and I, who is very much part of this whole process, uh, the door opens and your staff was there wanting to say hello, wanting to engage, wanting to be part of it. And I had goosebumps right now even talking about it. I said, we have never been greeted by uh, a group so enthusiastically because we... Uh, we're sharing um, a shared space, so to speak, of our total commitment of what each of us in our individual way can do. 
And so that perfect example from your office is the one that, that, is, that, that is with me. Um, when I first entered this whole uh, field uh, by uh, the centennial flame uh, and hearing Andrew's story, that was one voice. And then there was one group and then there was another group and so on and so forth. But this collaborative process uh, through CASDA and through Autism in Ontario, uh, this coalition as it continues to build, a one voice is a good voice, a strong voice, and governments you know, are paying attention. Uh, sometimes they stumble along, but I think they have honorable intentions because in talking to ministers and so on, when you talk about public service, that's what it is. Public servants are there to serve. And I have to believe in that. So we are that much closer, that much closer with a little jigsaw puzzle piece to put it into that empty space uh, to create what we all want, which is that national autism strategy. You know, as they say, we're all in this together. <laughs> Simple as that. Absolutely. So on that, that very fine note, um, I'd like to thank you from the bottom of my heart on behalf of Autism Ontario, Autistic Canadians, their families and colleagues and advocates all across Canada for the remarkable work that you have done to help move things forward, to make a difference in Canada, to make autism matter for all Canadians. Um, we thank you so much and um, wish you all the very best on your next stage of advocacy, um, retiring from the Senate seat, but not retiring from the work that you have claimed in your heart and in your head and in your actions um, to both you and Jeanette for the work that you have done. Um, and so again, we're also delighted to be presenting you with the award and we have actually a small plaque that will make sure oh. we get to you in person at some point, that's our goal, um, for the Jerry Bloomfield Award, who was um, one of the founding members of this organization. Um, he and his wife Elizabeth live in Guelph, Ontario and are still involved in autism advocacy themselves. And so um, we are delighted that you, we can count you among the people who have made that difference in Canada. Thank you so much. Mary, this means a lot to us. The award means a lot to us. And uh, we'll cherish that award. It's, it's a symbol of, uh, of collaboration, isn't it? From another idea at another time and carrying that idea on to a new time. So I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you.